All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, it's a cold, rainy, snowy, not great day here in Calgary. But you know what? I'm surrounded by trees. I got bird song. I got greenery behind me. I got coffee. I'm working with brandy. Life could be worse. It's spring. Um, lots of activity going on behind us, as you can hear. So I will project, I will yell, I'm good at that. I'll use the coffee for my throat, win-win. Um, there will be time at the end for, uh, for Q&A. Um, so if you have a, a question uh, regarding your tree, um, oh, what do I do with this? Uh, save it till the end. But if you're having trouble uh, following along, I'm going too fast, I'm not explaining myself, uh, please jump in. Um, Brandy is monitoring the chat. Uh, so she'll be able to keep an eye on things. So, um, yeah, without further ado, uh, we're going to talk trees today. I got my handy dandy notes right next to me. Um, so I'll be able to, to, to stay along. Uh, anybody who follows us on um, GA Kids TV knows that uh, we don't often do that. We shoot from the hip. Uh, but with our webinars, we try and stay a little more on focus. So I think it's important uh, to start with what a tree actually is. Um, when we're discussing a tree, uh, a lot of times um, the vernacular gets confused, um, especially when it comes to perennials. So a perennial, uh, which we already discussed, um, is a plant that returns every year. Well, by that very nature, a tree and a shrub is a perennial. However, when we're discussing trees, one of the differences, and I'll use this beauty right here, it's raining on me. So this year I can't pull the tag off, but it's a flowering crab apple. And um, a tree, it is a perennial. It is gonna come back every year but it's got a mostly wooden stem. When we talk about perennials in the garden world, uh, about a perennial bed, we're talking about a more herbaceous stem. Um, so more vegetative. This has a hard wooden stem. Uh, it's normally elongated and thicker. And that stem supports branches, which in turn support twigs, which in turn supports leaves, or in the case of a juniper here, can we see the juniper? Yeah, uh, needles, which are just a form of a leaf. And in turn, that supports flowers, which will then turn to fruit. So that is a, uh, a rough overview on what a tree is. And you can see the parts, of, and then obviously there's a root system. All the plants, annuals, perennials, and trees uh, have root systems. We'll get to a tree's root system later on. So what it comes down to is mankind has always been dependent upon trees. In the very beginning, um, you know, we cut them down. We used the lumber for boats, for houses. We still do. Um, for fuel, we burn it to keep warm. Um, you know, burn it to power vehicles even. Uh, for food, apples, oranges, all kinds of things like that. So historically, trees have been very important to us. And we also use them for shelter, um, which would be shelter from the sun, get in the shade of a tree, shelter from the rain, get under the canopy of a tree. Um, even to the point where we would climb trees way back, way, way, way back, I'm talking millennia ago, uh, it was a lot safer to be up in a tree than it was down on the ground uh, where you were easy pickings for certain animals. Then of course, certain animals climb trees, but that's a whole other story. So that was kind of, you know, where trees played a uh, very important and pivotal role in mankind as we evolved and moved forward. Now, when we're discussing trees, we discuss two main types, and that is the conifer evergreen or the deciduous. And it's really simple. Um, conifer simply means cone bearing tree and deciduous simply means a tree that drops its uh, leaves. Now, 
there is an exception to that. And if you're from Calgary, if you're from Alberta, you probably already know it. It's the large. Brandy knows it. In the, in the autumn, you're driving through the Rocky Mountains and you just see a swath of yellow. Um, all the other deciduous trees have dropped their leaves. The evergreens, the spruce and whatnot, the pine, still green and big. And then that bold yellow is the larch. And the larch is a deciduous conifer, which means it sheds its needles, but it is still cone bearing. Now that's the exception. For the most part, conifers are evergreen. Uh, they do have a spiky needle instead of a broad flat leaf that you tend to see more uh, with the deciduous tree. So those are our two main classifications of, uh, of trees. I should have separated my papers first. There we go. And then on a side note, and today we're gonna to focus on trees. I'm not gonna talk uh, too much about shrubs, uh, but they are really kind of in that same family. They go very well together. Um, and a shrub, much like a tree, uh, we recognize it as a perennial. It does come back every year. I grabbed this as an example of a shrub. This is a double flowering plum, uh, ridiculously popular. Every spring, uh, they bloom like this in people's gardens, and we get a plethora of people. Um, oh my God, my neighbor has this shrub, and it's covered in pink flowers. What is it? Probably a double flowering plum. Um, incredible. And the, the, the main difference of a shrub to a tree is height. Um, even though they're all low growing trees, we're gonna talk about those a bit later, shrubs tend to not get over, if I say 10 feet, I'm talking max. Normally they're in the, uh, you know, two foot to seven foot region. And shrubs, they do have a wooden stem, uh, but their branches, tend to be more chaotic and haphazard and come up out of the ground. Um, and the other thing about a shrub is they're easier to shape. We're gonna talk about pruning a tree later on, but with a lot of shrubs, you can kind of trim them back, you can keep them tight, you can shape them. Uh, a lot of times people will take um, electric hedge trimmers to them or garden shears, uh, especially in the case of um, cedars or cotoneasters. Uh, that people are shaping for a hedge. And with shrubs, uh, you've got potent tillers, you've got dogwoods, you've got hydrangea, junipers, spirea, uh, some lilacs or shrubs, the list goes on and on. So shrubs require a lot of the same things trees do, but we're gonna talk, like I said, primarily on trees today. But if you do have a shrub question at the end, hit me up, I'm all for it. So. A lot of times uh, when people are looking at their yard and they're deciding, you know, do I want a tree? Um, you know, if you've got a blank canvas of a garden, uh, you've got your house, you've got your property line, maybe a fence, and then it's just lawn. You might want a tree. And a lot of times uh, the primary reason, and there's nothing wrong with this being the only reason, you don't need to validate it, aesthetic beauty you want a focal point you want something great fantastic wonderful um there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with putting a tree like this in your garden that's covered in a plethora of blooms it's just it's full of flowers it attracts pollinators and everything else wonderful fragrant there's nothing wrong with that but then what ends up happening is that um <laughs> I got a double flowering plum. Oh, I just threw my notes on the ground too. Um, I got petals all over my notes. So I threw them uh, on the ground. Got rid of the petals though. Um, but then a lot of times uh, people may, may say, well, I'm putting this tree in for beauty. Are there any other effects? Is there something else I can do with it? And there absolutely is. Uh, trees are instrumental in noise control. Uh, you live next to a busy road, you put some trees between you and the road, you've got a sound barrier. Um, even in winter, you use a big spruce, that's going to work. Um, the soil integrity, uh, a lot of trees put out a mat of roots and it holds the soil in place. So it prevents soil erosion. Um, it, it limits 
uh, the chance that your soil is going to decay or break down. Oxygen. I think a lot of us know that trees are alone. They take in carbon dioxide and they put out oxygen. So having that around. Biodiversity, like I touched on, they'll attract pollinators. They'll attract songbirds. Uh, they may nest in there. You know, if you don't have something in your garden that's beneficial and damaging your garden, wow, it's chaotic in here today. <laughs> no. That's a, you know what? If you guys were here, it would be just as chaotic anyway. So welcome to the experience. We could do it upstairs in my office, but that would be boring and it would feel like it's too formal. I feel like I'd have to put on an accent like, oh, good morning. <laughs> um, so no, we're going to go with the chaos. Um, I lost my biodiversity. Um, if your garden doesn't have, say, aphids and ladybugs in it, and the aphids are eating your plants and the ladybugs are eating your aphids, um, or you've got squirrels running around, um, but then you've also got, you know, birds of prey uh, nipping around looking for them. And you've got all of this happening. Your garden is part of an ecosystem. That's fantastic. That's what you want. Uh, sterile gardens aren't great. They're a thing of the past. Um, the diversity is what you want, and trees add to that. They attract other things. Temperature control in your house. Um, the shade of a big tree can keep your house cooler in the summer, and then, it, you know, you have a big spruce um, or a large, uh, even, you know, a, a crab apple like this with a big canopy. It can cut the wind, um, so your house isn't going to get as cold in the winter. Uh, you can have privacy. So you put up trees and... Hey, presto, now your neighbors can't see in your yard. Water control. Trees with their root system and their thick stems can help uh, with flood mitigation. But they can also help with moisture retention and keep that moisture so it's not just going straight through a forest ground. I'm having trouble today. Uh, things are moving. Carbon capture, like we already touched on with oxygen, they go hand in hand. It pulls in carbon dioxide, it puts out oxygen. The aesthetic, first thing I touched on, something that doesn't get touched on enough, mental health. There's a reason a lot of people like going out into a forest, into an arboretum, into a city park. It's to be around the trees, the greenery, the height. It's good for us, it really is. And again, I'm just gonna to touch on this. I don't believe that that kind of thing is a cure-all for depression. Talk to a doctor, talk to friends, be aware but it can certainly help. I don't, I don't want anybody to read that as I believe it's a cure-all. Absolutely, but it helps. And that, that, that's been proven, dealing with trees does help. And last but not least, uh, food. Um, a lot of people will plant a regular apple tree and you know, within a year or two, they're picking apples off it. And pears, we're gonna get to that in a little bit. So speaking of that, um, a lot of people, will come in uh, and their house is, it's a tall house and it's casting shade, but they want a tree there. Now, a lot of times you might have to look for a shrub, uh, a dogwood or a viburnum, something like that. Uh, most trees don't like shade. That's why they get so big. They want the sun, okay, greedy buggers. Uh, but they want the sun um, that's coming in. So that's why they tower up in the forest and you got the shade loving perennials and annuals below them. But if you do have that spot, and it is quite shady, it gets a little bit of sun, but it's not full sun. Um, you can look at uh, birch and maple. They're a great one. And then fruit trees. And it always amazes people when they come in and they can see that they can grow cherries right here in Calgary. Um, unbelievable. And they do so good and they are so tasty. Pro tip though, when your tree starts going to cherry, uh, and they're out there and they're turning red, you are going to be in a race against the birds and the squirrels to get them. So just be aware of that. But you got apples and pears and plums. So there's fruit trees. Privacy. Uh, you want something fast growing, deciduous, that stays nice and tight? Columnar aspen or poplar. Uh, you, you've got a lot of space uh, and you want privacy all through the window. You've got a big bay window. You don't want people looking in, but you like the light. A big spruce tree further down the yard a collection of evergreens like that. Uh, they'll all work together. And then you've got an area that's small. You can't have something big. We've got a crab apple, blooms like this, but it's a weeping crab apple. The Siberian pea, the carragana, another great tree. 
and there's a weep in one of these. As you can see, it blooms and it puts out a little pea pod. So when you're looking and you go, oh, I want it for aesthetic, great answer. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Then you've got all of those other benefits. And then you've got trees uh, and some shrubs that will work in the space you have. So on we go with that. So you've decided to get a tree. Fantastic, great decision. Now, what do you do? How do you, you come here, you buy it, you leave with your tree, you get home. Now you're looking at that expansive lawn, all of your grass, and you got to put your tree in. How do you go about doing that? Well, first and foremost, you got to dig a hole. And I'm just going to check above me. Actually, I'm going to use my juniper. I'm going to, I was going to lift up the big one, but I'm not that strong. So I'm going to take my juniper. Uh, if you're dealing with junipers, as I hug it, you should probably wear gloves. I've planted a million and one of these things. Uh, I still get juniper rash, but it doesn't bother me. Uh, gloves are pretty good if you're planting a juniper. So the first thing I like to do is I like to take my shovel and I do a quick measurement, okay? Now I'm not measuring off the pot, okay? I see a lot of people do that. I'm measuring off of the soil inside the pot because that's where the crown of my tree is. That's where the tree comes above ground, the roots are below ground. That's where I wanna be. So I flip my shovel, I look inside, I do that. That's about the depth of my hole. I go across as tight as I can, again, inside to inside. That's about the width of my hole. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go about half as deep again. So that's my depth. I'm gonna go that deep. That's my width. I'm gonna double that. I'm gonna go that wide, okay? So I'm gonna dig my hole. Now I'm gonna get rid of the grass. Don't want the grass, but I'm gonna keep that soil, even if it's a clay and I'll explain why. So I'm gonna take a compost and I love my sea soil. I really do. I love this product, it's Canadian. Uh, they're out on Vancouver Island, amazing company, family owned, can't say enough about them, organic. Mwah. I love my sea soil. And I'm gonna use this to amend the soil. And I'm gonna amend the soil that I've just, I got the way things are going this morning, I'm not gonna be surprised if this falls over. Uh, you know what, why don't I lie it down? There we go, I can learn, I can learn people. Uh, it takes, what is this, fourth seminar? Yeah. Fifth? fifth seminar and I'm learning. We're learning together. Yeah. Um, amending soil. Um, so I'm gonna dig that soil out and I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna do about a 50-50 blend, which means I'm taking half of the existing soil, half compost, I'm mixing it together. Now, if it's a really, really heavy clay or vice versa, if it's a really loose soil full of small rocks and it's just crumbling, I might go a third existing soil and two thirds compost. But from what I've seen in Calgary, uh, the trees I've planted here, 50-50 is good. Now, the reason you do that, I see people dig a hole and they make an amazing soil blend. There's peat moss um, and there's compost and they put in a uh, biochar and they put in all of these things. They mix it all up and they get rid of all the existing soil. Great, you put your tree in, those roots, those adventitious roots are gonna hit that new stuff and they're gonna go, ah oh, yeah, and they're gonna go ripping through. The problem with that is when they hit the natural soil, the clay soil, they're not used to it. Okay, they've been growing in this loosey goosey rich mix. They hit that and a lot of times they go in, in, and they go down. Then they hit it at the base. Now you start getting root bound. You mix in that clay with your soil. Now it's giving them a 50-50. They're gonna hit some clay and they're gonna be like, oh, okay, I gotta get through this. And it's gonna toughen up your root system. So now, you got a hole half as deep again, twice as wide, you got your amended soil, okay? So now what you're gonna do is you're gonna take some of that soil, you're gonna push it in, and you're gonna firm it down. You're not gonna compact it. You're not taking your boot to it, your hands, normally enough, and you give it a push, you're firming that soil down, that's now your base. And you wanna bring that up, again, bring Mr. Juniper over to the height of the existing soil. Let's see. If I can get him out of his pot. Does he want to lift? Nope, he doesn't want to lift. I'm not going to lift him. 
So what you're going to do is you're going to get that so that when you put the tree in, this soil level here is perfectly flush with your existing soil level. And you're going to plant it in. You're going to make sure it's nice and straight. We're going to get to staking. Don't worry about that. Um, and, and basically, once it's in the hole, roughly bang center of where you've decided it's going to go, uh, you've got the depth set, everything is good. Now you're going to take the tree out of the pot. If it's bald and burlap, you're going to undo some of that. I hate to say this, but I'm going to bring it up. Every year we get returns from people. Now, it's very minor, uh, but every year we get returns from people that the tree dies. They planted it and they planted it in the pot. Okay. You want to take it out the pot. I always wait until everything is ready before my tree comes out of the pot. Now, if you're planting on a day like today, uh, it's overcast, uh, it's wet and everything else, you, your roots probably aren't going to suffer. Um, maybe I can get this guy out easier. I want to bring it, I want to bring one out so that you guys can see it and see how I do it. So, all I'm doing. I'm just loosening my soil ball in the pot. You'll notice I'm not putting it on the ground and crushing it, just giving it to me like that. I'm going to brace the crown. There we go. And I'm going to lift it out. And that's what it should look like. So this is a shrub, but again, looks like I'm doing laundry tonight. Um, again, they play very well. So now I'm lifting it out and I'm setting it in the hole. And this is what I'm talking about. Look at the height difference. So that's why I measure off my root ball. Now, if it's a bit low or a bit high, lift it back out, fix accordingly, get it in. You want this with your existing soil, remember. Okay, we're gonna put you back in. Now, once it's out for a new tree, I really recommend this product. This is called Mike. Uh, it works so well, it gives you a five year warranty. So if your tree or shrub dies within five years of planting it, as long as you bought Mike, you're gonna get a full refund. Um, and all it is, it's a mycorrhizal fungus. It bonds to the root system and encourages incredibly vigorous root growth. Um, I honestly champion it. One, you get a five-year warranty. They give a five-year warranty because it works. It's that simple. So you wanna take out your Mike and you wanna rub it all over the root ball. Um, and you want to get that root ball covered. Okay, so now your tree is in the hole. You've got your soil mixed. Uh, you've got all of your backfill done. You've added your mic. Your tree's nice and centered. It's roughly straight. Now you're going to backfill. So you're going to take the rest of that existing soil that you've blended with your sea salt. You're going to push it in. And what you're going to do is you're going to come up maybe a quarter of the way, and you're going to firm that soil. Just do, again, you're not using your heel. You're not pounding it in, you're firming it. You're getting rid of air pockets. You're making sure that it's got good adherence to the root system. Don't push on the root system. You don't want to damage the roots. You're firming down the soil around it, okay? Then again, firm it down. So you're going up in quarters, give or take. All the way up till it's nice and firm. Now, the soil that you've backfilled is level with this soil, is level with the existing soil. So you've got a perfect plateau, okay? I don't know why I keep moving this guy, I keep bringing it back to. <laughs> then you're gonna create what they call a tree well. And if you look at the slide, you'll see the ground comes up. So all a tree well is, take the rest of your soil and almost build a little wall around your tree. What are you about an inch high, two inches high? Nice and tight, you wanna pack that. Then you're gonna mulch. Uh, it doesn't matter what mulch you use. Honestly, it really doesn't. I didn't grab a bag because I didn't want to confuse anybody. Use a colored mulch, use cedar, use shredded, use mulch chips. I don't care. Um, but I like to put mulch down. Mulch is going to help. Hey, I had a visitor on my glasses. <laughs> mulch is going to help um, with moisture retention. It's going to help with temperature. It's just a really good thing, especially on a new planted tree. So now you've mulched it, you got your tree in its hole, and I'm just noticing on my notes, I put this in the wrong order. Now you're gonna stake your tree. I got water in there. Water should be the next last thing you do before you fertilize. 
And when you stake the tree, this is what you're going to use. And again, we're going to go back to the slides because I want to show you guys something. The amount of times that I see people stake a tree and they put the stake directly in to the root ball to keep the tree anchored and firm. Well, the problem with that is you're doing it so the tree doesn't fall over. If you're in the root ball of the tree, you've done two things. You've damaged the roots. Now, if the tree falls, the root ball is coming with it, which means the stake is coming with it. So you want your stake to be in that existing ground. This is a great kit. It's got everything you need in it. You can see right there, three stakes. You go on three angles, and all you got to do is straighten it up. It's always a good idea to have a second person, uh, simply because then you don't have to get up, get back down, get back up, get back down. You can have somebody looking at your angles. I always go on a north, south, east, west, which way, and you straighten it up, firm it in, you stake it, and then you water. And when you water, I mean you want to water. Um, we did a video last fall, and I planted a tree. And a lot of people were astonished by how much water I gave it. Uh, you want to fill that tree well, that little uh, moat uh, you built around your tree, fill it to the top. You're going to do that every day for two weeks. Then you're going to taper off to every two to three days. Then you're going to taper off to as needed. Now, we're going to get to that when we talk about maintaining an existing tree. Then you're going to fertilize accordingly. So if you look at the mic, it should say on here, I haven't read the back of the, uh, the mic in a while, um, but it says somewhere on here, um that you should uh fertilize uh two weeks to a month after using mike let this do its job first then get a fertilizer and it doesn't matter get the fertilizer that's best for you we're going to talk about this as well but you've amended the soil fantastic great you've given it what it needs you've added mike so you've given the roots what they need now you've staked it you've supported it wonderful You've picked the area, full sun, great. Your tree's got everything it needs. You've supported it, so it's not gonna blow over. It's not gonna fall over. Now you're gonna fertilize. Why miss the last step? This is gonna increase the overall health of the tree. Then you wanna start a fertilizer program and you fertilize accordingly. And by that, I just simply mean, follow the manufacturer's recommendations. A lot of people over fertilize, a lot of people under fertilize, some don't fertilize at all. Um, if it says do it every week, do it every week. If it says do it every two weeks, every two weeks. If it says in the case of a water soluble, 10 milliliters to the liter, 10 milliliters to the liter it is. If you're unsure how to measure, go less, not more. So that is uh, all in how you're going to plant your new tree. Then you're just gonna keep an eye on it and you're gonna let everything else uh, do what it does. So now you planted your tree. You did that two years ago. Now it's an existing tree. So this tree is growing in your garden. Every year it comes back. Like I said, it is perennial in nature. So how do you, what is the best practice to maintain the overall health of an existing tree? Well, one of the first things that you can do is Keep an eye out for any kind of pathogen, pest or disease uh, that you're gonna see. So if you know at the end of last year, uh, your tree had aphids, um, maybe it had powdery mildew, maybe it had black knot, okay? That's where this comes in. Now this is a dormant spray kit, okay? And these work incredibly well. You want to use this late winter, early spring. You can use it any time in the winter, uh, I don't personally like to. Uh, I find that uh, when everything is frozen solid and it's minus 40, it's not doing a whole lot of good. Um, I like to do it, uh, keep an eye on your tree when it warms up a bit, but the tree hasn't opened yet. And this is just a two part system. It says right there, I can show you the pictures. It's horticultural oil and lime sulfur. The reason. Uh, you want to put this on is the horticultural oil treats your pests. Uh, so it's going to treat aphids and aphid eggs. Uh, it's going to treat oyster scale, 
which we have a huge problem with here in Calgary. And oyster scale, you get a small window to deal with it. Outside of that, forget about it. And then the uh, lime sulfur is going to treat the disease, the fungal disease, uh, the black knot and the powdery mildew. And it's just a great jump start on the pathogens that you have there. So the clue is in the name. If your tree has broken dormancy, so if you've got a tight bud and the leaf's already coming out, you probably don't want to use this. Uh, you don't want to coat that leaf with oil. Uh, you can suffocate the leaf. The oil can get into the stomata. The stomatas, you can't see them. Uh, millions of tiny holes on a leaf that allow the gas exchange that we call photosynthesis. So you don't want to clog them up. The other thing, you don't want to put oil on it because you can get sunburn. So once the leaves are coming out, it's too late for that, but we still can do a few things. We'll get to that. So the next thing you want to do is you want to assess your winter damage. So most trees after a winter uh, will have a little bit of damage. Depends on the tree, depends on the winter, depends how healthy it was going into the winter. Uh, was it relatively new? Did it, uh, was it an older tree that was sick? Number of factors, that doesn't matter. Uh, regardless, you want to give your tree an assessment. And we always look for the five Ds, okay? Now there's four primary ones, and that is dead, diseased, damaged, or dangerous. Dead is a branch, completely brown, desiccated, it died back. Uh, it can be maturity, it can be health, any number of factors. But if that's dead, you want to get rid of it. Same with diseased and damaged. Maybe you got black knot forming. Get rid of it. Uh, damaged. Now the branch isn't dead, there's still a leaf, but it's snapped. Well, where that break is, infection can start getting in. The tree is more susceptible. You want to get rid of it. And then dangerous can be a branch that has started growing uh, over your house, over your car, uh, over wires. Now you may need help with that if it's a big tree. You may need to call in professionals. Um, you don't want to try and remove a dangerous branch and put yourself in danger. Uh, you're kind of uh, defeating the point. So those are the ones that you're going to look for first. The fifth key is desirable. That's where you're going to prune for shape. Maybe you've got a branch sticking out like this and it just, you're not liking it. You, you, you don't like the fact that one branch is coming out this way. You want to nip it back for the shape and the overall aesthetic uh, and design of the tree. Do the others first. You, you can't not prune dead. You can't not prune diseased and damaged. And you absolutely should prune dangerous. Well, once you've got them off, then you want to look at the shape of the tree. Maybe this branch sticking out, you don't like the look of it, but the tree needs it uh, because it's lost a lot of uh, other growth and it needs a photosynthesis. So it might not be uh, desirable to you aesthetically, but it might be desirable for the tree for health. So there's a lot of things to take into factor, but desirable is always last. The others, it's like when you break your arm. You break your arm, you need to do something about it, okay? Uh, hopefully not prune it off. Um, but you need to get a cast. Well, after you get the cast, that's when people can start writing on it. That's the desirable part. You don't have people writing on it before you have it on. Same kind of mentality. You have to deal with the damage and the structure and the health before you deal with the desirable. So those are the five Ds that you look for. So now uh, our tree has been dormant. Uh, we've seen it actively growing. So we've ascertained uh, if it's dead, we've ascertained you know, the five Ds, disease, damaged, uh, dangerous, um, desirable. So now it has active growth. So now you can't use my, only use this on a new planting, okay? So now we're gonna look at fertilizer. And I see people think, oh, uh, my tree's sitting there. Um, there's nothing really happening right now. I should get a jump start on it. Uh, absolutely, please do not do that for a couple of reasons. Hmm. Hot coffee to help with a soft throat from shouting. <laughs> Next week, I am going to learn to bring water with me. And we will be talking about watering very soon. Um, fertilizing, right. 
So a lot of times uh, we get an early spring or it's springtime. The tree hasn't had a chance to leaf out. It's not out of its dormancy yet. And people go, ooh, I'll fertilize. Well, what can end up happening is the ground to you seems like it's thawed, but a foot down, it's still frozen. That's why the tree hasn't, one of the reasons, the tree hasn't broken dormancy yet. Now you start adding fertilizer. One, you're wasting your time, money, and fertilizer. Uh, energy. You're wasting all of that because the tree isn't drinking it. Two, the salts that are in the fertilizer can start coming up the roots. Then they crystallize. The water runs away. Well, then the root wakes up, but now it's got something clogging it, so it can't do its job properly. So when you see active growth, when you see those leaves starting to burst open, that's when you fertilize. That means the tree's awake and ready to rock and roll. And as we're talking about existing trees, I included in the slide so that you guys can see exactly how you want to fertilize the fertilizer zone. Excuse me. And again, use a tree fertilizer. And most tree fertilizers you're gonna see have got a high first number, 1533, 622. Even this one, 288. That first number is nitrogen. Nitrogen is above ground leafy growth. Most of what a tree is, is above ground leafy growth. Now, if you planted your tree with mite, you know those roots are running. You did a fertilizer program the year before, you know the overall health is good. As you promote this above ground leafy growth, the leaves start coming out. Well, they're doing photosynthesis. They're getting all the sugars and all the food going down to the roots. Now the roots have the energy to go further to look for water, to look for more uh, natural micronutrients in the soil. They're getting more water. They're bringing it up. They're sending it to the leaves, more leaves, more sun. It's an ever going cycle. The trunk facilitates all of that. The, the fluid, the sugar, the gas exchange, all of this is happening all of the time. As I'm talking, this tree is doing that, okay? Um, I always say fertilize accordingly and do not over fertilize. Even if you're gonna use a tree spike, okay? If you're gonna use a granulate, if you're gonna use a water soluble, more is not better. If a doctor tells you, oh, you have an infection, take one antibiotic a day, you don't go, hey, I should take four, that would be better for me. No, you take one a day for two weeks and hey, presto, you feel better. Same with a tree. Think of it like that. This is for overall health. If you're using too much, what you can end up doing is you're not leaving the tree dependent to go look for its own stuff. You're giving it everything it needs. Um, you can clog it up again with those um, salts and the minerals start clogging up the roots. So you're not actually giving it any benefit. You're holding it back. And then use the fertilizer that is right for you. Maybe you like a time delay one. You're busy, we all are. A lot of things going on in your life. Um, you wanna just put your fertilizer down, kind of forget about it, give the tree what it needs. Uh, maybe a tree spike. Maybe you're gonna be away for a bit in the summer. So you put in a couple of spikes and away you go. Maybe you wanna really baby the tree, nurture it, you enjoy it, whatever the reason, water soluble. I always like water soluble, so I like to water and fertilize. I know how much the tree is getting. Water soluble is my go-to, um, but the other ones, they fit a need for what people are looking for and they fertilize the tree. So you want to keep an eye on that. And then the other thing, which, uh, come on notes, which I just touched on, as your leaves open up, so you've missed your ability to use this, but you notice your leaf isn't healthy. Uh, and maybe you've got a problem uh, with birch leaf miner, in which case you need a product like Tanglefoot to stop them crawling up the tree to get into the leaves. Uh, maybe there's a powdery mildew. It overwintered and it's already coming out. Then you can start using products like this. You can start using nematodes. Uh, you can start using fungal sprays. Um, this has no oil, so it's not going to burn the leaf. It's not going to clog the stomata. If you know you had a pathogen last year, you couldn't get under control. You see a sign of it this year already. Get on it, the quicker the better. Again, I'll equate it to a human. If you're feeling poorly, you're not feeling well, you have an infection. 
the vast majority of the time, that's not going to go away on its own. Uh, you don't have a, a sinus infection and then magically feel better. What normally ends up happening is you end up with an ear infection or a throat infection. Now you got to take a stronger dose of antibiotics more often. You need more rest. You need to stay home more. Sucks in the summer uh, because you didn't treat it. You get that sniffle, you're like, oh no, this is not a common cold. You get to the doctor, they can treat it quicker and easier. Same thing. You identify a pathogen sooner, you can treat it quicker, and you can actually help the tree be healthy and fight it itself. So you want to always keep an eye on that. Now, over and under water. So you can see in the two pictures, a lot of times when we overwater a tree, uh, we think we're helping it. We are not. Those roots have no reason to go deep to look for water. They've got it all. Uh, it starts getting too hot, you're cooling it down with the water. So those roots stay very shallow. What ends up happening is you have very low stability. Have you ever seen a tree come out of the ground, rip down? A lot of times the roots that are out are extremely shallow. That's because there's no anchoring roots. They haven't gone and looked for their own water or nutrients. And then the other thing, they're susceptible to temperature fluctuations. You go away, it gets scorching hot. Well, those roots are only this far below the ground. They heat up too quick. Now they start drying out. It gets really cold without any insulating snow coverage. Those root tips are burning in the frost and there isn't an advanced deep root system um, to help them come back. So you want to let the tree tell you when it needs water. So your tree's looking great. It's all up like this, like, look at me, I'm a tree, I'm happy. And then you see it kind of be like, oh boy, it's hot out here. And it will water it. Water, water, water. Okay. It lifts back up. Great. Now it's back to being healthy. Those roots are going again. Those roots don't find water. It's like, hey, can you give me a hand? Thank you very much. Roots go deeper. Give me a hand. Thank you very much. And after a while, you don't have to give it a hand. It's found its own water source and it drinks accordingly. So your tree will tell you when it needs water. Now, uh, especially with some mature trees or ones you've planted, fruit trees and whatnot, if you're not sure, give it a drink. Uh, you underwater and that tree dries out and dies. Ugh. It's better to be a little heavier than it is lighter but let the tree tell you, be aware of the signs of your tree. And then you'll remember, we talked about staking and these are amazing for a young tree. So when you put your stake on, you want it loosey goosey, okay? So when you've staked that tree, you want it to move. That's gonna strengthen the root system. You don't want your tree to be atrophied. You don't want it to be locked in position. If you never, ever, ever move, uh, you're like me, you spend all winter lying on the couch, playing on your phone. Um, and then you, spring comes, you're like, I'm gonna garden. You're out there for like an hour and you're like, oh my God, my back is killing me. Cause you haven't moved. But by summer you're digging, you're lifting, you're shoveling, you're moving your compost bin. Because your back has been healthier, you've been moving it, you've been exercising. Same with a tree, you want that movement happening. Now, as the tree matures, so you've got your stake around here. You want your stake loose so your tree can move. You don't want it rigid. As the tree grows though, it's going to grow into that stake. And you can see in the picture I provided, what ends up happening is the wood grows around the stake. Well, now you've weakened it. You've constricted that now. So all those veins I was talking about, all of the capillaries, inside the tree that allow for gas and sugar and moisture exchange, they're not, they're not cramped, they're bottlenecked. Plus a heavy windstorm, frost, moisture gets in there and freezes. You have a weak susceptible area on your tree. So after a year, two years, once that new tree is established and those roots are deep, get your stakes off before it gets to that problem. And then, and this is, the most important part of planting a tree, enjoy it. Enjoy the shade, sit out there, enjoy the fragrance, enjoy the hummingbirds and the butterflies and the bees. Uh, enjoy watching the kids play around it. Just love it. I mean, that's, 
the first thing I touched on when people come in for a tree is aesthetic. And if you remember, I said, that is an answer in and of itself. I want a tree because I want something pretty. Yes, absolutely. I support that. So enjoy your tree. Kick back. Enjoy the shape. Enjoy the apple you pick off it. Make cranberry jam. Enjoy the fact that your neighbors can't see you. Okay? There's so many things to enjoy. So that wraps us up.